He's the first and only drug trafficker to appear on the list of Britain's richest people. Some estimate his fortune to be as high as 300 million pounds. And Warren isn't the only Liverpool villain to have made millions from crime. This is the story of how Liverpool crooks went from run-of-the-mill robbers to drug-dealing millionaires. As a city that spawned the Beatles and all conquering football teams became the UK's centre of excellence for drug smuggling. Armed robberies were committed, kitties were made, and that was the implosion of the drugs. And I remember this firm saying to me, Charlie, it's like throwing a million quid into the Mersey. I said, I don't want to get involved in A ton was nothing. I mean, we started off with a ton, but a ton was nothing. This is also the story of how police finally brought down Liverpool's Mr Biggs, with more than a little help from an informer. See, he's been in grass and been in grass. They are killing people slowly, and the likes of them people shouldn't be allowed to do that. Liverpool is a city made great by its port. In the 18th century, the slave trade funded its rise. A hundred years later, Liverpool ships carried British products around the globe. And by the early 20th century, the city was at its peak. Its position on England's northwest coast, facing the Americas, helped it dominate transatlantic trade and gain the nickname, the New York of Europe. But by the Second World War, its heyday was over. As Britain traded more with Europe, Liverpool found itself on the wrong coast. Yet its days as a booming international city had left a legacy. There were grand commercial buildings, long established immigrant communities, and the first signs of illegal drugs. Future crime lord Michael Showers grew up in Toxteth, the heartland of Liverpool's black community and he was aware of one drug from an early age. I'd seen weed from childhood. I'd seen it being sold, being brought in on ships by seamen and things like that. So it was just a normal, everyday part of my life. At this time, cannabis smoking was largely associated with Liverpool's black community. Weed originated in black countries. Black seamen brought it to Britain and it was mostly black people who smoked weed rather than drank. In the 1950s, a third of all British convictions for illegal drugs were in Liverpool. Yet this drug dealing remained small scale and localized. For aspiring criminals, there were far more obvious routes to riches, especially robbery. Charlie Seeger is a Liverpool villain whose career began in the 50s. We were rebelling at the time, really, the way our forefathers were kept down, working in factories and all that crap, you know what I mean? We wanted a car and we wanted nice things in life, and the only way I could acquire it was stealing, robbing. In the 1950s, Britain's economy was largely cash-based. Age 17, Seeger found the easiest way to get that cash was safe-blowing. Blowing a safe was so simple. People thought, oh, it's the pinnacle of excellence, you know, the, the top gangsters, top robbers, you know, safe blown, oh my God. So simple. And what you've done is you laid the safe down on its back. Now, here's the simplest part. You open a packet of jelly, jelly ignite, and you just push that into the keyhole. Then you'd get your detonator, and you'd push it right in. Just light it, get behind the wall somewhere, or behind an office desk, here, and it just go bump, like a dull thud bump. Seeger formed a small gang and became a regular safe cracker. But though he claims blowing a safe was easy, keeping the blast secret was not. Every time a safe was getting blown, it was like a chase, or it was on top. Sometimes we'd have to abandon everything and go. So Seeger says he had a brainwave. 
Every single family went to the pictures and they were full up every night. And I knew there was plenty and plenty of readies in them safes. Plus the fact, you stand outside a picture house and there's a big war film going on inside, you can't hear it. You know it's soundproof. Blowing a safe in a cinema made criminal sense. So Seeger put his theory to the test. He broke into a picture house with his brother and another robber one Sunday night. Seeger kept watch whilst the other two set the explosives. And it was my brother, my older brother, and he shouted down to me, hey, he said, everything okay there? And I'd seen two busies, two coppers, further down the road on the way up. And I just wanted to test my theory. I thought, oh, I'll tell them it's okay, you know, you know the way you do. And I shouted, yeah, go on, blow it. Dead custody down here, no problem, you know. The safe went off. I looked at the two coppers across the road and he didn't bat an eyelid. Cracking cinema safes proved Seeger's route to making big money. So we were knocking pictures out of off left, right and centre. And it was big money to us. I mean, don't forget, I was a 17, 18 year old kid. But robbing cinemas couldn't last forever. Picture houses got wise to the robbers and upped their security. So criminals like Seeger had to move on. It's like everything else. The authorities bring all these like um, sophisticated uh, alarm systems out, but the criminal mind somehow over overcomes that and finds a way around it. As Seeger went in search of new ways of stealing money, the cops were barely keeping up with the robbers. Albert Kirby joined Liverpool Police in 1964 when techniques were far from sophisticated. We all felt that we were behind their game uh, because we didn't have the, the availabilities to do surveillance, to, to gain evidence and the forensic issues. You had to have a book to tell you you walk down one street, turn right down another. That's how pathetic it was. By the time Kirby was patrolling the streets in the 60s, villains had moved on from safe cracking. Big money then was security vans, and post office vans. And so it was all like wage snatches then. Quick, fast, two minutes in and out. Michael Showers was one young robber. He'd been sent to juvenile prison in 1963 for his part in a dance hall stabbing. He claims his experiences there set him off on a career as a criminal. I came out of Borsal a very bitter and angry youth. Very, very bitter. And I started stealing then. It got so that your name gets bandied about in certain groups. You get known. And that's where I, I started doing um, armed robberies, blacks, banks, vans, anything at all. Michael Showers was now a professional crook. Some people carry a briefcase and went to work at 9 to 5. Our group carried a shotgun and balaclavas and we went to work whenever we did. Showers was establishing himself as an armed robber, but he would go down in criminal history for a different reason. In the mid-60s, society was changing. A revolution in youth culture, with Liverpool and the Beatles at the forefront, was transforming attitudes, and drug use was on the rise. In 1966, Liverpool police formed a vice squad to deal with the new clubs and the increase in drug use. Albert Kirby signed up. People then were using drugs as part of their social habit. You know, the Purple Hearts, as they used to call them then, which was the main drugs, uh, which were going around the clubs. And then cannabis was becoming uh, commonplace. And there was the demand by people to use it, you know, for social recreation. As demand increased, so did the opportunities for criminals with money to invest. 
late 60s, someone uh, said, listen, if you buy me a pound, a weight, what they call a weight in those days, which is one pound weight, he said, I can give you a good return. And in those days, a pound weight of um, Lebanese cannabis resin was around about a hundred and something pounds. So what's the return? He says, well, I'll give you uh, 400 pounds. And I saw there was money to be made in that. Michael Showers was helping forge the modern drugs market. Yet in the late 60s, the big criminal money remained in robbery. Throughout the decade, Liverpool crooks had been looking for new ways to steal. And in August 69, they unveiled their latest secret weapon. It was just such an eye-opener to actually hear and see what they'd had the audacity to do. Over the August bank holiday, a gang of thieves broke into the district bank on Water Street using a duplicate key. Charlie Seeger says he knew the villains involved who found getting in was the easy bit. The banks had no alarms. Windows were open in banks. They solely relied on the vaults. That was their, the main security, the vaults of the bank. The banks assumed their vaults were impenetrable, but they hadn't bargained on the latest bit of robber's kit. A thermic lance. They were the best things what, what could ever be invented for a robber. You know, you could burn through metal what was unheard of before. What's better to go in a place on the weekend, just relax, chill out, maybe have a flask with you, have a cup of tea and all that, and just burn away at the safe, at the vault. It was the first real experience we'd had of dealing with criminals who had a, a, a lot of sophistication. And then to use the ventilation system within the bank to take away the toxic fumes from the thermic lances. None of us had seen anything like that. Over the weekend, the team plundered the vault of the district bank. And they just come out after they'd done the work and mingled in with the crowds the next day and out they went. It's as simple as that. The gang's hoard was worth 160 grand, over two million pounds in today's money. It seemed the perfect bank robbery. A lot of these firms were great at doing these jobs. It's the aftermath where somebody silly in the firm can make a terrible mistake. That someone was Tommy Tacker Comerford. He was sort of like on the fringes of everything. Any firm, he'd sort of sniff his way in. Comerford's mistake was to give a cigarette case he'd stolen from the bank to his favourite barrister. Several weeks later, that lawyer attended a function in one of Liverpool's grandest buildings, St George's Hall. He pulls out this cigarette case and a sharp-eyed busy who was on the case of the bank spotted it. Hello, he said, where about did you require that from? Oh, a client of mine gave it to me. Well, that was it. The Water Street bank job propelled Comerford to criminal stardom. It was fame he would later use to become Britain's first drugs baron. As Comerford began a 10-year sentence, another drugs pioneer was also doing jail time. Michael Showers. By 1970, Showers was an armed robber with a growing sideline in cannabis dealing. He was also an increasingly big figure in Toxteth and prepared to use violence to maintain that reputation. To me, violence is a tool to be used sparingly and if necessary. In April 1970, Michael Showers unleashed that tool on a man at a now demolished Toxteth club. It was the Somali Social Club, which is on Upper Parliament Street. Now his uncle owned the club. He was um, 
a small guy who had something of a Napoleon complex, but he carried a gun and brandished it on a regular basis to people. And he did it to the wrong person. The person went away and took a shotgun and blasted him in the legs. Showers still denies pulling the trigger. I didn't actually shoot anybody. I was present. I was present. There's no two ways about it. I was present. The jury didn't believe him. Showers was convicted at Liverpool Crown Court of wounding with intent and sentenced to seven years. The rise of this future godfather of Toxteth was temporarily stalled. By the early 70s, Liverpool's Beatle-inspired spell in the limelight had passed. The city was in the midst of its long decline. The population was plummeting, and many of its docks were being abandoned. Paul Grimes grew up in a family reliant on those docks. The docks went from as far as you can see down there, right the way to that new building, a funny shaped building there, right up to the the windmills up there, that's how big the dock was, and it was fantastic at the time. But Grimes and his family weren't dockers, they were dock thieves. <laughs> dock theft had a long history in Liverpool. In many ways, it was the city's signature crime and it was a world away from cutting-edge bank jobs. In the 60s and 70s, we were getting a lot of problem with cigarettes going, with whiskey going, and those are the type of crimes, but you didn't really need an awful lot of skill for those. Robbing from the docks was all about who you knew. We used to have people on the docks that used to give us the wine and they had loads of like ciggies in, whiskey, gin and all, all, the, all the spirits that you could get rid of. But it was just, it was just knowing the right people that you could grease down with a few quid and get away with it. But by the 70s, the dock thieves' days were numbered. Less and less cargo was manhandled off ships as containers became the norm. It was now harder for thieves to get their hands on goods so they adapted. When that's, it all started getting tight on there, you had to start looking around for warehouses and out of town and all that of it to make more money. Paul Grimes joined a team known as the Hole in the Wall Gang in honour of their trademark method. I like the excitement of knocking holes in walls and all that. Sitting there with a hammer and chisel, just tapping away until you get the bricks out and the first couple of bricks out and then you can get the rest out dead easy then. It's all between 60 and 70 grand every time you did something, which was, was quite handy money. Actually, so you didn't have to work for a while. These warehouse raids spelt the end of dock theft in Liverpool. In the future, the city would have a new and sinister signature crime, drug trafficking. In 1974, Michael Showers emerged from prison. He saw that demand for cannabis was still growing and set about transforming its supply. Showers made the pioneering decision to buy his cannabis direct from Africa. In doing so, he felt he had a natural advantage over rival Liverpool criminals. He was black. We could go to Africa, Asia, Jamaica and either know somebody or have a relative there or family roots there as I did in countries in Africa. I could go there, I could buy, I could put it on a ship, and 10 days, turn around, it could be here in Liverpool, container could be taken off. By going to Africa and importing cannabis direct, he dramatically increased the supply of drugs. A ton was nothing. I mean, we started off with a ton, but a ton was nothing. And you multiply, by that time, you're talking about 300 pound a pound. You work out the value of a ton. 
If Shower's figures are accurate, a ton of cannabis was worth nearly £700,000 in the 1970s. Millions today. Showers was growing very wealthy and didn't care who knew it. I remember at one time I, I was I was away for I think it was around about six months uh, in different in various countries. And when I came back to England, um, I was given my proceeds. And I think that week I bought a Rolls Royce cash, a house cash, another house for a member of my family cash. That's the kind of money. Michael Showers was living proof big money could be made from drugs. Yet while some criminals took note, others still saw robbery as the game to be in. Charlie Seeger demonstrated how the Liverpool villain was always on the lookout for the next opportunity, whether in Liverpool or beyond. It was getting a bit hot for me in Liverpool. Um, so I thought the best cure for this is out of sight, out of mind. So I bought myself a beautiful cottage and I met this guy over there, over in Wales, where I was, and he was an antique dealer. And he said, there, I know where there's a fortune to be made in this game. So of course you listen, don't you? Charlie Seeger needed little encouragement. He began robbing the country houses of North Wales of their antiques. There's two types of different antiques what we used to go for. And antique dealers know this saying. You'd either have the smalls, we call them the light removal business, that's the silverware and the jewellery, or the big stuff. Seeger couldn't keep his new enterprise secret from the police for long. He said I was controlling all the antiques in the northwest. Charlie Seeger was this, that. Oh, no, no, there's a lot of people at the antiques, but I was involved with the antiques, and I'm, we made plenty of money at them. Seeger was never caught stealing antiques. Though he has served three jail sentences, faced countless charges including murder, and gained the nickname Killer, Seeger has received no convictions since the mid-60s. Yet as Seeger lived his charmed criminal life, his hometown was entering perhaps its bleakest decade. On the 3rd of July 1981, the Toxteth district erupted into an orgy of violence. It was the worst public disorder Britain had witnessed that century. And young robber Stephen French was at the heart of it. I was toe to toe with the old enemy. Yeah. At last, the playing field had been levelled. Yeah. And we could have a pitch battle. It was so emotional seeing all these police officers from literally all over the, the, the north of England, coming out with head bandages, arms in slings, on crutches. And I'd never seen you know, police officers attacked in the way that they were, because they'd had bricks thrown at them, there'd been petrol bombs, they'd been attacked in the street. It was absolutely frightening to see it. They bust them in from all over, put the lads from St. Helens up front. Yeah, right. They got slaughtered. We slaughtered them. For three days, the authorities lost all control over Toxteth. Estimates suggest up to 1,000 police officers were injured and as many as 140 buildings destroyed. But why? It was a combination of the social deprivation, the lack of opportunity, the no work, and they're getting pushed around all the time. In 1981, over 40 per cent of young men in Toxteth were unemployed, and official reports identified this as the root cause. However, some police officers felt underworld leaders took an active role in fermenting the riots. In the build-up to those riots, really the main personal people um, that we were concentrating on was Michael Showers and his brother Delroy Showers. 
we as police were causing them a lot of problem with it within Topsy. So they, you could see there was a build-up of, of public disorder, disturbances, really to make the police keep out of there, to say, keep your nose out of here, we want to carry on our drug dealing. Whether by accident or design, the riots did create a no-go zone for police. Out of Toxteth would come one of the richest criminals in British history. Yet the hard drugs revolution on Merseyside would not come from Toxteth, but the other side of the Mersey. And it caught everyone by surprise. Mike Malloy was a police inspector on the Wirral, the peninsula across the Mersey from Liverpool. And in the early 80s, he was coming across increasing numbers of heroin addicts who had all been sold the same lie by dealers. The lie was, if you chase the dragon, which is smoking the heroin through the, the fumes, through the silver foil, you can't get addicted. And, and these people fell for it. And within months, we had an epidemic. Between 1979 and 1984, burglary trebled. The Wirral's main town of Birkenhead earned the nickname Smack City and became known as Britain's number one heroin black spot. In 1984, Mike Malloy led a unit to find out why, and the answer began several years earlier in Liverpool. Armed robbers in the 70s were particularly active, and our, our job was to tackle armed robbers. And we did it, and did it very, very successfully. So like anything else, crime is a business. It has to evolve. So they decided, somebody along the line, somebody decided, let's put our money into drugs. And that's what they did. These Liverpool armed robbers had very good reasons for setting up business on the other side of the Mersey. It's like the old mafiosi, you don't do it on your own doorstep, but you do it on somebody else's doorstep. And as I say, because there was no really hardened criminal gangs on the Whittle, they weren't frightened. They thought, well, who the hell's gonna retaliate from the Whittle? Whilst there were no hardened gangs on the Wirral, the gangsters eventually found themselves up against Mike Malloy's new unit. It took us 12 months, the first 12 months, to climb that ladder. But we not only smashed it to a certain extent, we also put away the guys behind it, the guys who had set it up. That was the first organised, shall we say, cartel that started. Because of our actions, they had to go somewhere so it turned back on itself, and Liverpool got the problem, which it still has till today. The established criminals causing this problem would become known as the Liverpool Mafia. The Liverpool Mafia were white middle-aged criminals who worked on the docks. They were experts at smuggling contraband. They made a lot of money from armed robbery, and they were able to invest that in drug shipments. Career villain Charlie Seeger watched many of his peers dive headlong into the gold rush. I know a few of the lads what got involved in drugs, the old school. Good lads, but the money was so plenty to me and it was a sought after commodity people wanted it. I was offered to go into the trade and I knocked it back. And I remember this firm saying to me, Charlie, it's like throwing a million quid into the Mersey. I said, I don't want to get involved in that. It's backstabbing. You're starting to trust people, got to trust people who's devious. Nah, I don't want to know that. I'll stick to what I'm doing. One man who seized the opportunity was Tommy Comerford, the so-called mastermind of the Water Street bank robbery. Comerford started importing a whole range of drugs, from heroin to LSD, and became the first British criminal to forge links with most of the world's drug regions and made him a fortune. But Comerford still lived in a council house. I always remember Tommy lived just off Scotland Road, nothing loud or, or about it, and claiming all his benefits. And yet he was making th probably thousands, hundreds of thousands through all his criminal activities. But that's the type of cheapy character uh, that he was. Comerford was a successful but careless operator. In 1984, he was placed under surveillance by the regional crime squad. Just six weeks later, he swanned through Heathrow Airport, carrying two suitcases. 
When stopped by cops, one case was found to contain half a kilo of heroin. He was the biggest fish yet caught by the police. In the mid-80s, money from drugs was revolutionizing the underworld at every level, from the Liverpool Mafia to emerging Toxteth criminals. Places like Toxteth became very, very different places after the riots. These, these places were full of anti-authoritarian people who didn't trust the police, so were prepared to get involved in the black market. That black market was the drugs trade. And on the streets of Toxteth, dealers started to cash in and create new types of crime. Stephen French was a martial arts star who in 1985 won a world kickboxing championship. But there was little money to be made in martial arts, so French earned it as a bouncer and a robber until he stumbled across a new way of making money. I'm working then on the doors in a place called the Grafton, and a mate of mine was a drug dealer. He had his product took off him, and he came to me and said to us, this has happened, can you, can you know the people? Anyway, we went and got, got the stuff back for him, and he was gonna give us five grand for getting us the stuff back. French was curious how much these drugs were worth, so he contacted a young dealer and robber he knew, Curtis Warren. I phoned my mate Curtis and I said, I've got this thing, I didn't know nothing about it, I've got this thing, here, boom, boom. And then Curtis told me that it was worth 30 grand. So then I realised the money that was involved. It was then that the penny dropped for Stephen French. I was a robber, yeah. I was a tea leaf, I was a thief, yeah. So I think, well, this drug dealer, he's got all this money. Yeah. If I take his money off him, what can he do? I'm beginning to believe that I'm invincible. The baddest man on the planet. Yeah, I'm like actually beginning to believe my own hype. Yeah, and I start to rob drug dealers. Yeah, it's called taxation. For French and men like him, taxation appeared the perfect crime. I didn't, I didn't never rob drugs, I robbed money. I always wanted the cash, yeah, right? And I used extreme violence, yeah, to do it. Yeah, I'd be clad all in black, I'd have a balaclava and I'd have one of the biggest knives you've ever seen. Today, Stephen French believes his violence had far-reaching repercussions. How does? 10 stone, 11 stone drug dealer protecting myself from former British, European and world kickboxing champion, amateur boxing champion, yeah, a very physical guy. How does he protect himself from me? He arms himself, gets himself a 38. Drugs introduced a lot more violence into the underworld because the stakes suddenly became very, very high. It was no longer just about stealing 10 grand from a post office. Uh, you could make a million pound in three or four days. And I've spoken to drug dealers who did that in the 1980s. As this new generation got rich quick, Toxteth's cannabis pioneer Michael Showers appeared to take a very different route. By the 80s, Showers claims to have retired from importing drugs. I retired because, number one, I didn't need to take the risks anymore. I didn't need to. I was, my house was paid for. Uh, everything I had was paid for. I had bling before bling was bling. <laughs> um, I didn't need anything. I was living a good life. In the wake of the Toxteth riots, Michael Showers turned himself into a community spokesman, meeting politicians and appearing on TV debates. The chief constable, the chief constable said that's his problem. It's also a problem of the city because we would never have had a riot had we not had the chief constable we have. And Michael had the ability to convince the politicians and the local councillors that we as a police force were misbehaving we were being oppressive in the way that we were policing it. And initially they believed him. 
In a remarkable turnaround, Michael Showers, a drug dealer with convictions for shooting and stabbing, landed a job for Liverpool Council as an immigration advisor. Now he lamented the impact hard drugs were having on his part of Liverpool. I saw a scale of deprivation from heroin that I'd never ever seen from the likes of cannabis. And that's why I didn't particularly care for it. The police noticed Shower's new stance. However, they didn't necessarily believe it. Well, gradually over the years, he, he began to um, reinvent himself, as it were, as uh, a man of the people. And uh, but we knew what he was. He was a villain. The police were right. Showers was still importing drugs. In 1990, he was sentenced to 22 years for masterminding a two million pound heroin import. At the time, Customs called Showers the most significant UK national arrested in the fight against heroin. Yet a fellow Tuxteth man was about to make even Showers look like small fry, Curtis Warren. Warren's rise is one of the most remarkable in British criminal history. He first made the news age 16 when he mugged a 78-year-old woman on the steps of Liverpool's Metropolitan Cathedral. Eight years later, he was arrested in Switzerland trying to rob a shoe shop. By the early 90s, he had progressed to mid-level drug dealing. I first heard of him very much in the early 90s uh, when we were investigating more regional uh, drug trafficking. Seemed to have um, some criminal convictions, but nothing of, of any significance. Mysteriously, though, Warren made a huge leap forwards. In a relatively short period of time, um, he would seem to have developed from working on a sort of fairly local basis uh, to being uh, suspected of being involved in far-reaching international uh, drug trafficking. In September 1991, Curtis Warren flew to Venezuela with a drug dealer named Brian Charrington. What happened on that trip remains unclear, but it is clear that at the same time, 1,000 kilos of cocaine were shipped from Venezuela to Liverpool hidden inside 50 lead ingots. On arrival, the coke was extracted and the ingots disposed of. The man called in was dock thief turned scrap dealer, Paul Grimes. He phoned me yard up when I had the business of scrap metal and asked me if I could get rid of a load of lead, lead ingots. But Grimes was the wrong man to ask. By 1991, his son Jason had become hooked on heroin. It had left Grimes with a vendetta against drug dealers. Not that the man selling him the ingots knew this. He was telling me all this, the situation on what happened, about the drugs being in, in the bottom of them, what sorts of boxes they was in, little steel boxes and all that. And I related all that back to the customs. Former robber Paul Grimes had turned informer. When he learned a second import of cocaine was imminent, he tipped off customs, who pounced on arrival. They seized 150 million pounds worth of cocaine and arrested a dozen suspected drug traffickers, including Warren. In April 1993, the case came to court, but there was a huge problem. Defendant Brian Charrington was a police informer. The judge ruled evidence against Warren was inadmissible and instructed the jury to acquit. When they got found not guilty, he was a bit of a gobsmack for me. I thought he was, he was going away, but what happened with the customs, I don't know, I just haven't got a clue. I'll be cocked up on it. Warren was free to go. As for Paul Grimes, by turning supergrass, he'd committed the biggest no-no of the criminal world. See, he's been a grass and been a grass. See, I've never grasped on a robber or what I used to do, but a drug dealer is an entirely different person. They are killing people slowly. 
and them to let, and making money out of it. And the likes of them people shouldn't be allowed to do that. Grimes had good reason to be unrepentant. In the run-up to the trial, his son Jason had died of an overdose on his 21st birthday. For police and customs, Warren's acquittal was a disaster. Resources were now poured into catching Warren and smashing his organization. Cop Mike Keogh was at the heart of a huge new operation, codenamed Crayfish. This is an activity that takes a lot of planning for their organization as well as ours. So the planning takes place over a number of months, sometimes in, 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 in years. For two years, intelligence was gathered that put Warren at the center of Merseyside's drug supply. But police lacked definitive evidence. Then events on Liverpool streets took a deadly turn. In May 1995, a businessman named David Ungi was shot dead in the south of Liverpool. Whilst his family deny Ungi was an underworld figure, his assassination sparked a gang war. Following that event, there was a lot of tensions uh, around um, Liverpool between various factions. And as a result of that, it was very difficult for business to, to carry on. Almost overnight, criminals began settling scores with guns. In response, armed police officers were put on routine patrol for the first time in Britain. Fearing disruption to his operations, Warren decided to disappear. But his choice of destination would prove his undoing. Holland. Tom Dreesen, deputy director of Europol, is one of the most senior figures in Europe's fight against drugs. Back in the 90s, he worked for the Dutch police when Curtis Warren wandered into his patch. What he thought is that Holland is a very tolerant, easy country to live. He could uh, have a nice uh, life over here. And he thought that uh, when he escaped the UK, there won't be any investigation towards him. We saw that he, he was a smart guy. and He chose the place to stay very carefully. House alone in a, in a little village called Sassenheim. He was somewhere under the radar, so he believed. Smart, perhaps. But Warren wasn't aware of a crucial difference between British and Dutch law. And in Holland, we have the advantage that when somebody is a severe suspect, with the permission of our uh, court, we can wiretap people. For five months, Warren's phone was tapped, and the results were jaw-dropping. Police heard Warren's casual threats to blow up rival gangsters. They learned a senior Merseyside cop and passed confidential information onto Warren's associates for money. And that Warren had links with the world's biggest cocaine exporters in Colombia. Once the Dutch had gathered enough evidence, they raided Warren's home and the home of his gang 30 kilometers away. At the moment we were arrested, we saw that they had hand grenades and automatic weapons under their uh, pillow and next to their bed, so that was a dangerous operation. This time, there would be no escape for Warren. He was convicted of drug trafficking and running a criminal organization and jailed for 12 years in Holland. Back in the UK, the reverberations were huge. Detective Chief Inspector Elmore Davis became the most senior cop jailed for corruption in nearly 30 years. Whilst Operation Crayfish led to the arrests of 129 men, and officers began recovering Warren's money, which estimates put as high as 300 million pounds. It had been a remarkable journey for Liverpool crime. From the 1950s, when safe blowers were top dogs, to the 90s, when a Liverpool criminal was said to be worth a quarter of a billion pounds. And the villains who helped shape the underworld 
have taken very different paths. Charlie Seeger is now a successful writer and penning his fourth book. Stephen French has renounced his former life and now campaigns against gang violence. I now run the Increase the Peace program. I speak to, to dozens and dozens of kids up and down the country, and lots of them, they want out. They just don't know how to get out. And things like this, yeah, will keep kids off the streets. Paul Grimes went on to inform on a second major drug importer and had to leave Liverpool. But there has been a couple, a couple of threats and all that. I had to move addresses and all that, carry on. So people didn't know where to live and what have you. And that was it. Just had to protect myself. And Michael Showers emerged from prison in 2000 and mourns the area he once supplied drugs to. What you see today, it's a war zone compared with what, what it was. I mean, it's been totally decimated. As for Liverpool itself, whilst the population has halved from its peak in the 1930s, the long decline may be over. The city has recently gone through something of a renaissance and is no longer reliant on its docks. But then nor is the drug trade, as the likes of cannabis are increasingly grown in Liverpool. Just as in the 1950s, the criminals are always trying to stay one step ahead, and the police are still working hard to keep up. They work jolly hard to succeed, um, the police service, and certainly here in this city, uh, which has had its problems, but gladly, through a lot of hard work, determination, uh, you're seeing the good results.